Well, before we begin this morning, I do want to give the warmest of greetings to you, uh, the congregation of First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, my name is uh, John Payne. I am the organizing pastor of Christ Church Presbyterian, uh, a Reformed and Confessional congregation, a PCA congregation, uh, just two and a half miles east of you in Charleston, South Carolina. Your uh, senior minister, uh, Dr. Derek uh, Thomas, has been a dear friend and a mentor for almost 20 years. And your assistant pastor, Gabriel Fleurer, has been a dear friend as well for over a decade. I'm grateful for the invitation to uh, speak to you today and for the strong ties between our two congregations as we have shared many members uh, over the years. And I'm only sorry that we couldn't all be together today. The assignment given to me this morning is to answer the question, what is Jesus doing in today's worship? What is Jesus doing in today's worship? It's a massively important question for the believer since gathered worship on the Lord's Day is the most meaningful and consequential activity in which Christians engage in this life and in the next. Lord's Day worship is not just another meeting in the church, nor is it meant to be an evangelistic meeting or a time to amuse a crowd with lively music and inspirational speakers. It seems that so much for what passes as Christian worship today falls under these categories. Indeed, about two years ago, a large and influential church in our own community launched a summer sermon series focused on movies and what spiritual applications can be made through uh, modern movies. But to, kick, to kick off the series on a Sunday morning with a bang, uh, the church hired professional clowns, acrobats, and singers to reenact a scene from a popular movie called The Greatest Showman. Popcorn was available to the congregation during the production, and many Christians raved about it online. I know it's often with uh, good intentions that uh, a growing number of churches do things like this, a desiring to appeal to the lost, a, a desire to reach the unchurched uh, for Christ. But is this what Jesus ever intended for the worship of his church? Is Lord's Day worship a blank canvas upon which we can express our creativity, imagination, and ingenuity? Or does Jesus have something else in mind? Well, if we go to God's word for our answers, we can be confident uh, that uh, what Jesus is doing in today's worship is what he was doing in the worship of the early church. It's very much what uh, the Protestant reformers did in uh, their uh, ad fontis, going back to uh, the sources. Uh, rather than embrace all uh, of the ceremony, uh, the, the smells and bells of the Roman Catholic Church, they went back to the Word of God to see how the New Testament church worshipped in uh, its simplicity and according to the Word of God. As our final prophet, as our final prophet, Jesus is proclaiming his life-transforming Word to us in worship, teaching us all that he promised and commanded to the end of the age. As our final high priest, he is interceding for us as our mediator. And through word and sacrament, he is nourishing our faith spiritually upon his flesh and his blood. And as our final king, he is shepherding us and protecting us and ruling over us, not least by giving us divine regulations for worship, regulations for God's glory and for our ultimate good. And of course, it is through uh, trained and qualified ministers that Christ himself is ministering and leading, ministering to and leading his church. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful that our risen king doesn't leave the most important activity of the church up to us to figure out? The Reformed have always embraced the principle that our Lord's Day morning and evening worship services are regulated by the Word of God, indeed regulated by Christ and not by us. Left in our hands, worship becomes like the worship of Israel in the desert. 
where golden calves become fashioned for the people. In the Westminster Confession of Faith, the confession that our two churches uh, hold fast to, uh, there's a clear word about how worship is to be regulated according to the Word of God. In uh, Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter uh, 21 and paragraph 1, it states this, The light of nature showeth that there is a God who hath lordship and sovereignty over all is good and doth good unto all, and is therefore to be feared, loved, praised, called upon, trusted in, and served with all the heart, with all the soul, and with all the might. Now here's the key point here. But the acceptable way of worshiping the true God is instituted by himself, and so limited by his own revealed will, that he may not be worshiped according to the imaginations and devices of men or the suggestions of Satan under any visible representation or any other way not prescribed in Holy Scripture. Properly understood then, Lord's Day worship, Lord's Day worship is the unique and sacred context in which the triune God meets with his covenant people, not on our terms, but on his terms. And it's in this holy context that God reinforces his saving love to us through his word and sacraments. And through them fashions us more and more into the image of Christ. Let me say this again. Properly understood, Lord's Day worship is the unique and sacred context in which the triune God meets with his covenant people on his terms And in this holy context, God reinforces his saving love to us through word and sacrament and through them, through these means of grace, fashions us into the image of Christ. Our spirit-filled response to this is one of love and wonder and praise and devotion. And we'll consider all of this more later. But worship, rightly understood, is primarily Not what we do for God, but what God does for us and what God has done for us and what he shall do for us. If we don't get this right, if we don't get this right, our worship will soon become man-centered and works-based. That is, worship that is mainly focused on what we do for God rather than what God has done for us. In Christ. And so we're answering this question what is Jesus doing in today's worship? There are uh, many different ways that we could uh, uh, go at this uh, important subject. Uh, It's a a massive subject, uh, the worship of the church, and of course, specifically how Christ Himself is is, is ministering uh, to us uh, in the context of the worship of the church. But we're going to focus on uh, simply two areas. Uh, Number one is that Jesus is exercising his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king in the worship of the church. Jesus is exercising his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king in the context of the worship of the church. And and secondly, Jesus is discipling his church in the worship of the church. Uh, Worship is discipleship. So, number one, Jesus is exercising his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king uh, in the worship of the church. Well, it's important if we're to think about the nature of worship to go back to the beginning. Worship in the Garden of Eden was perfect. Uh, You thought that you had some amazing uh, times of worship uh, within the sanctuary of First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, South Carolina. I've, I've worshiped with you there. It's a marvelous a place to worship, and uh, there may have been times where you felt that uh, it was just about perfect worship, maybe even perfect worship, Uh, but this side of heaven, uh, there is no absolutely perfect worship that we uh, perform. But worship in the Garden of Eden was perfect prior to the fall. God created Adam and Eve in his own image with knowledge, holiness, and original righteousness. Mankind uh, 
was created with a rational soul, different than the animals. Mankind is created with a soul in which he can commune with God. Sin was unknown in the pre-fall garden. The garden paradise was therefore a temple of pure and unadulterated worship. What a context it must have been. But Adam, uh, as you know, our federal representative and the perfect worshiper of God, believed the devil's lies and he fell into sin. Perfect worship no longer existed. The perfect worshiper had fallen into sin. Sin and idolatry entered the heart of mankind and we became separated from God. Rather than draw near to him, we began to hide from him, thinking that we can hide from him. Filled with guilt and with shame, wicked mankind was now repelled rather than drawn to the holiness and the pure loveliness of God. But God did not simply leave us to perish in our misery and in our sinful and foolish desire for autonomy. No, in his infinite love and mercy, God made great and precious promises to us, and he pursued us by his grace and with his grace. The Old Testament is the unfolding story of uh, this redemption, whereby God makes covenant promises to his uh, covenant people and then fulfills those promises through his son. The worship in the Old Testament took place in the tabernacle and uh, the temple uh, there uh, in those uh, places ordained priests ordained by God uh, took spotless lambs and he sacrificed uh, them uh, on behalf of the people of Israel as an atonement for their known and their unknown sins. God also gave prophets to Israel to declare God's message of judgment and salvation to them, to warn them of the wrath to come, and to point them to the coming Messiah. And God gave them kings to rule over them, to lead them, and to protect them. These prophets, priests, and kings were called to foster a nation of true worshipers, to model and to exercise and to safeguard true worship, worship according to God's word. However, as many of you will know, who know your Old Testaments, these prophets and priests and kings fell terribly short of God's standard. Like everyone else, they were marked by sin and, and sometimes by great scandal. God's people would need a prophet, a priest, and a king that could truly model and exercise and safeguard true worship. Someone who could lead us back to God. Someone that could walk us up that holy hill to have communion with God once again. Someone who could reconcile us to God and give us peace with God and be the perfect worshiper on behalf of his people. Someone who could lead us back into the garden paradise and to the sinless, perfect worship modeled at creation. Of course, you know who that someone was and is. It's our crucified, risen, and ascended Lord Jesus Christ. In his stellar new volume entitled Reformation Worship, uh, Johnny Gibson writes this, quote, as an unblemished sacrifice and flawless high priest, Jesus underwent the flaming sword of God's judgment in his death, and then in his resurrection, he led the way back into the presence of God to the tree of life. In the final moment of his perfect obedient life, as he breathed his final breath, the temple curtain was torn in two signifying the end of the old way of worship and beginning of the new way of worship in the real holy of holies above. There seated at his, at his father's right hand, Jesus conducts the worship of heaven. And from there, now hear this, from there, he purifies the worship of his church, 
on earth. From there, he purifies the worship of his church on earth. And so now, as we gather together with our high priest leading in the holy of holies in heaven, representing us there as we worship, even as we worship with sin in our hearts and, and, and with worship that is not perfectly purified coming out of us, our worship is offered in heaven through the mediation of Christ, our high priest, and presented to the Father once again as glorious, perfect worship, mediated worship through the mediation of Jesus Christ. It's why we pray in Jesus' name. It's why word, sacraments, and prayer are the means of grace and in the wisdom of God are leading us again and again to our Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 and 2 state, Now the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. The tent, the tabernacle that was set up in the Old Testament was merely a, a, a foreshadowing, a picture of the true worship in heaven led by Christ. Hebrews 10, 19 through 25. We are familiar with these verses. And it's because Christ is our great high priest and he is leading the worship in heaven and thus as our representative leading us as we worship God down here on earth uh, Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened to us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. An allusion to baptism there. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Now listen, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day, the day of the return of Christ drawing near. So here we have a picture of God's baptized people, uh, baptized uh, into the name of Christ, uh, sprinkled clean by his blood uh, from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water from sin, and united to Christ and to one another in him. And we approach the throne of grace boldly and with confidence, not because we deserve to be there by our own rights and by our own merits, but because we come through the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ, the perfect worshiper, our worship leader, our high priest. Uh, beloved, this is what Christ is doing in worship in today's church. It's what he's been doing from the beginning. And so we approach God now with the assurance of faith, not faith in our own works and our own moral strivings, but faith in the person and work of Christ. We come, we approach God with confidence, not in ourselves, but in the redemptive work of our Savior. We enter God's presence in worship through a new and living way with hearts full of faith. The word sacraments and prayer, these divinely instituted means of grace, remind us of this reality every time that we gather. And that's why they must never be marginalized or removed in our worship services. To marginalize the means of grace, the faithful reading and preaching of Scripture, uh, the true administration of the sacraments, and uh, the offering of Christ-centered prayers, the, to marginalize these means is to marginalize God. It is to marginalize Jesus Christ himself in our worship. And so if we gather together and the means of grace are not front and center, Christ is not front and center. The gospel is not front and center. And we may be gathering to do something, but it is surely not worship. It was David Wells who, uh, years ago, I was reading uh, in one of his books, he said, you know, one of the biggest problems with the worship of the church is that God is resting lightly upon the worship of the church. 
There's not a sense of reverence and awe that we are meeting with the living God. And this is what we see in the modern uh, church so often is this, this, this lightness, this, this carefree kind of give God a high five as, as you enter the sanctuary attitude rather than one of reverence and love and deep joy and comfort that comes when the means of grace are set forth uh, in the service. The Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism in uh, uh, questions 23 through 26 reinforced this uh, clear teaching in Scripture that Christ is our final prophet, priest, and king. And, and as our prophet, priest, and king, again, he is leading us in worship. He is, he is uh, working in our midst uh, in the context of worship. Uh, and here it says in question 23, what offices does Christ execute as our redeemer? Answer, Christ as our redeemer executes the offices of a prophet, a priest, and a king, both in his estate of humiliation and exaltation. In other words, when he was here, in his humiliation on earth, uh, born uh, of a Virgin Mary, born into this sin-torn world, uh, had no place to lay his head, living a life of uh, a humiliation, having set aside his divine privileges, Philippians chapter 2. And then, of course, ultimately, at the cross and in the tomb, Christ was uh, under a state of humiliation. Christ still was exercising his three offices of prophet, priest, and king. But it's also in a state of exaltation where he is now, risen, ascended, and exalted, and at the right hand of God. And so the question now, question 24, how does Christ execute the office of a prophet? Answer, Christ executes the office of a prophet in revealing to us, by his word and spirit, the will of God for our salvation. That's how he exercises his office of prophet, revealing to us by his word, of, word and spirit, the will of God for our salvation. Next, question 25, how does Christ execute the office of a priest? Christ executes the office of a priest in his once offering up of himself a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice and reconcile us to God and in making continual intercession for us. Those Old Testament priests they made sacrifices of, of, of animals on behalf of the people. They themselves needed those atoning sacrifices because they themselves were sinners. But Christ, as the perfect high priest, gives himself. He is both priest and lamb, giving himself, offering himself up for his people as a sacrifice to satisfy divine justice. For God to be God, he must carry out justice against sin, against rebellion. And Christ gives himself in our place to save us from our sin, to reconcile us to God and make continual intercession for us. As our priest, he gives himself for us and he continues to intercede for us. And then question 26, how does Christ execute the office of a king? Christ executes the office of a king in subduing us to himself, in ruling and defending us, and in restraining and conquering all his and our enemies. So what is Jesus doing in today's worship? He is first and foremost representing us in heaven as the perfect worshiper. And dear ones, uh, dear members uh, of, of First Presbyterian Church in Columbia, as you are entering your beautiful sanctuary, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, or when you begin to do so again after this time of quarantine, think about this. Think about this. Christ is representing you in heaven as the perfect worshiper. Your worship will always fall short of God's glory. It will never be that which it is supposed to be. You will never love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. You will never approach God as you ought, but Christ does, and he represents you. He represents you, and he loves you, and his nail-scarred hands and feet bear testimony to his love for you 
And he is at God's right hand, representing you, representing me in heaven as the perfect worshiper. Adam failed, but Christ did not. As the second Adam, he becomes the perfect worshiper who loves God with all his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he worships God perfectly. Secondly, he leads us in heaven as the perfect worship leader. Christ leads us in worship. He's the perfect worship leader. He is the perfect liturgist. He comes up with the content of worship. He, in his word, reveals to us uh, logical orders of worship so that we would come before him, uh, uh, worshiping him according to scripture and the principles of scripture. Thirdly, he is exercising, of course, his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king in worship. How so? Well, as a prophet, he is declaring his word to us as it is read and as it is preached in worship. You may say, wait a minute, isn't that uh, Pastor uh, Derek and Pastor uh, Gabe who are reading the scriptures in worship? That's not Jesus. No, Jesus speaks to us through his word. And so when the ordained minister set apart by God for this very purpose... When he reads the word of God publicly in the context of this sacred assembly, Christ is speaking to you. Christ the prophet is declaring his truth to you. When the word of God is faithfully preached, Christ is proclaiming his salvation and judgment to you in that context. And, uh, and also when there is instruction, uh, when there are words of comfort from God's word, Christ the prophet is bringing you these things. Secondly, Christ exercises his office of priest in public worship. Namely, he is, as the ministers are, uh, are carrying out uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper, we have Christ as high priest through the minister offering himself to his people. Uh, he is offering himself to us spiritually at the Lord's table, uh, giving us the bread and the wine, representations of his body and blood. There we have sweet communion with the one in whom we have union by his spirit. Christ prays for us in heaven, and we know as the ministers are praying for God's people and their prayers are are full of God's word. We know that there, there's a kind of echo from heaven's truth back to heaven. And Christ himself is ministering to us as our high priest, representing us and, of course, leading us into the holy of holies as we gather together. And then thirdly, he is our king in public worship. He is shepherding us. He is leading us. He is comforting us. He is protecting us. He is rebuking us and correcting us, and he is ruling over us. Our king, our shepherd king, is leading us in public worship. So Christ is our prophet, our priest, and our king, and he is exercising this threefold office in the context of the sacred assembly on the Lord's Day this is what Jesus is doing. We're not just going through a formality. God, the blessed triune God, is working in the context of public worship by his spirit and word. You know, another wonderful uh, section to go to when we think about some of these principles. I uh, recently preached on Psalm 23, and it occurred to me that it would be helpful to bring up uh, Psalms 22 through 24 because there we have a beautiful succession of how Christ himself dies for us, becomes our shepherd, and then leads us into the Holy of Holies. In fact, in Psalm 22, which is uh, labeled the Psalm of the Cross, it begins with, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It draws attention to several areas uh, of Christ's passion uh, on Calvary. And, and there we see wonderful prophecy being uh, made and then fulfilled at the cross uh, of Christ. We have the Psalm of the Cross in Psalm 22 where the point is being made that a Messiah would come and would accomplish redemption for us by giving himself as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then we know that uh, Psalm 23 reinforces that the Lord is our shepherd and in him we lack no good thing. He leads us beside 
the still waters. He makes us lie down in green pastures. He restores our souls. Uh, he, uh, of course, leads us down the path of righteousness for his name's sake and through the valley of the shadow of death where we fear, fear no evil because he is with us. He sets a table for us in the presence of our enemies and, of course, pursues us and he anoints our heads with oil and pursues us all the days of our life and into eternity. You see, the lamb who died for us in Psalm 22 becomes our shepherd in Psalm 23, who then in Psalm 24 leads us up the holy hill and before the throne of God to worship. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 6 say this, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation, such as the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of God, the God of Jacob. You may say, wow, with th these requirements, I can't ascend the hill of the Lord. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, I can't go. I, I, I'm not allowed. But let us not forget, Christ becomes the perfect worshiper. Christ becomes the one with clean hands and a pure heart who ascends the hill of the Lord. And with, he, with his nail-scarred hands and feet, he ascends the hill of the Lord, not just for himself, but for us but for his people, for whom he lived, died, and rose again. And so as Christ ascends the holy hill with clean hands and a pure heart, and does not lift up his soul to what is false, and does not swear deceitfully, and receives the blessing from the Lord, we follow him by grace through faith. We are united to him. And he leads us into the Holy of Holies where the curtain has been torn and where now in Christ we worship with clean hands and a pure heart. And we receive righteousness from the God of our salvation, the righteousness of Christ through faith. And so this is the first point. This is the first point. Christ himself in the context of the sacred assembly of Lord's Day worship, Christ in today's worship, is ministering to his people as he exercises his threefold offices of prophet, priest, and king. The second thing Jesus is doing is he's discipling us. He's discipling us in today's worship. Lord's Day worship is the grand theater of discipleship. It's the main context in which Christians are fashioned into mature disciples of Jesus Christ through the ordained means of grace. It has been this way from the beginning. In our day, however, the biblical focus of worship as discipleship seems to be lost on many of our churches. Indeed, the accent of disciple-making is placed upon small groups or one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring, uh, or rather, upon, uh, rather than upon uh, the public worship and the means of grace. Indeed, many believe that discipleship is predominantly occurring in living rooms and in coffee shops and not in the sacred assemblies of the church, in the sanctuary. This unbiblical notion is more widespread than people realize. Our churches, dear ones, need to recover the biblical priority of Lord's Day public worship as the primary realm, as the primary context of Christian discipleship. Furthermore, we need to reclaim the biblical elements of public worship as the efficacious means to spiritual maturity, the means that work in the lives of God's elect. In other words, we must recover discipleship on God's terms, which means we recover worship on God's terms. Before we explain the nature of worship as discipleship, we must first ask, what has gone wrong? What has gone wrong? Why, why do we uh, in the modern church often not conceive of worship as where God is making disciples 
Well, as it concerns discipleship, a significant shift took place in the first half of the 20th century in both the United States and Great Britain. In response to the rising tide of theological liberalism and main in the mainline denominations on, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, parachurch organizations began to sprout and to multiply. Understandably, Bible-believing Christians lost confidence in the church. So they began looking elsewhere for spiritual direction. They found it in uh, evangelical organizations, parachurch organizations, such as the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, or Campus Crusade for Christ, uh, or Christianity Today, or Christian Student Union in the UK, and a, and a host of others. Parachurch organizations like these rightly emphasized a high view of Scripture, biblical conversion, and lifelong spiritual growth and discipleship. Nevertheless, Christian discipleship was repeatedly presented as being only loosely connected to the worship and ministry of the church. It's the idea that real disciples are, not, are formed not in the theater of ordinary word and sacrament ministry and the care and elder of the deacons, but in the parachurch enclaves for super spirituality, end quote. A prime example of this may be seen in The Navigators, a well-known and influential parachurch organization that has specialized in life-on-life -life discipleship since 1933. In the About section of their website, uh, just a few months ago, in the About section of their website, not one word is mentioned about the church. Moreover, their statement of faith, core values, and vision statement give no meaningful attention to the ministry of the church or the means of grace. Someone reading the site could easily conclude that the church has very little, if anything, to do with Christian discipleship. It's no wonder then why so many evangelicals do not make the Lord's Day morning and evening worship a priority in the disciple-making process. To rightly understand Lord's Day worship as discipleship, therefore, we must first recognize what public worship is not. We, of course, uh, touched upon this at the beginning of this lecture. Worship is not an evangelistic crusade meeting. Neither is it a time for sanctified entertainment to showcase the talents of pastors, congregants, musicians, singers, dancers, or actors. Nor is public worship an informal church fellowship meeting to energize and inform the flock about up-and-coming programs and service opportunities. While sadly these emphases have become all too familiar in worship services today, nowhere in Scripture, nowhere in Scripture does divine worship display these characteristics. No, God's Word teaches something very different. Biblical worship, biblical worship again, is a sacred meeting between God and His covenant people, namely the visible church. It's where Christ, as we mentioned before, through His Word and Spirit, matures His disciples. In other words, worship is the sacred context wherein the ascended Christ Himself, as prophet, priest, and king, informs, feeds, nourishes, comforts, and fortifies the faith of his flock through the ordinary means of grace. Please get this. God is not just present with us in public worship. He is active among us through his word, sacraments, and prayer. Therefore, Lord's Day worship is intended to be no less than the salvific inbreaking of the greater eternal realities of the kingdom of God into the lesser temporal realities of the kingdom of man. Isn't that wonderful to think of this reality that is taking place whenever we gather for worship on the Lord's day? The glorious spiritual powers of the age to come are breaking into this present evil age, an evil age where there is uh, sickness, uh, civil unrest, uh, the, the terrible treatment of our fellow human beings, all of these uh, wars and rumors of wars and uh, political intrigues and, uh, and all these terrible things that take place in this world. It's a wonderful blessing to gather together and to remember that this world is not our home. And God 
through his glorious gospel of grace and the realities of the world to come breaks in to our world and proclaims to us the good news that there is indeed salvation in Jesus Christ. Worship, therefore, is the workshop of the Holy Spirit and not just another meeting of the church. It's where disciples are made. Since the Lord's Day, since Lord's Day worship is the primary activity of the church, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, and essential to Christian discipleship, it's also important to mention that it should be led by the ministers. Indeed, God's ministers are, quote, according to 1 Corinthians 4.1, servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Ministers, ordained ministers, have been called by God and set apart by the church to lead, feed, and disciple God's people. Therefore, handing over the leadership of public worship to lay people necessarily undermines the function and priority of worship as discipleship, and by the way, also undermines the idea that Christ himself... The risen and ascended Christ himself, the, worship, the perfect worshiper and the worship leader is leading God's people in worship. And who is supposed to lead in his name God's people? What's well, the ordained ministers? Those who, who, those who have been set aside to represent Christ to the people as they carry out uh, and exercise the means of grace. How does this relate to the Great Commission and the making of disciples? Isn't the mission of the church to make disciples? Shouldn't worship be related to this? Well, after his glorious resurrection, shortly before ascending into heaven, Jesus declared to the apostles, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Notice that Jesus clearly states both the mandate and the means for the church's mission. The mandate, of course, is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The means or the tools for fulfilling this mission are the word of God and sacraments. The spirit-filled apostles carried out Christ's commission in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, Acts 1.8. They went forth boldly into all nations, proclaiming the gospel, making new disciples, and planting new churches constituted of believers and their children. These churches, led by qualified and appointed elders, were dedicated to the lifelong discipleship of their members through the ordinary means of grace. In other words, in other words, please get this, in the gathered worship of the church, through the weekly cadence of the faithful ministry of word, sacraments, and prayer, the primary work of discipleship was being accomplished. And so as the means of grace are faithfully set forth week after week in public worship, and God's special presence is manifested amongst his covenant people, God is actively discipling his people. The making of disciples and fulfillment of the Great Commission, therefore, is not just something that happens out there on the mission field. It's not just something that happens among the Aborigines in the outback or the citizens of Madagascar. No, the making of disciples occurs every Lord's Day in morning and evening worship in every true church. And those congregations that are most committed to making mature disciples at home are usually the ones who are most dedicated to making disciples around the world. Isn't that how it often works? Lord's Day worship, it must also be said, is lifelong discipleship. A holy anvil of sanctifying grace from the font to the grave. Unlike weeds, mighty live oaks do not spring up overnight. Strong and deep roots take years, even decades to grow. This is also true for the Christian disciple. Consequently, any book or teaching series that promises seven quick steps to Christian maturity uh, misunderstand the nature of discipleship. It's a long endeavor, an ultra marathon, and not a sprint. So by way of conclusion... Parachurch organizations may and often do provide helpful avenues and 
resources for Christian discipleship. We never want to disparage that. Even so, they should never be adopted as a substitute for the ministry and worship of the local church. Moreover, small groups and one-on-one -on -one mentoring, while often beneficial, should always be viewed as the fruit of Lord's Day worship and discipleship and never an alternative to it. The church and the means of grace are God's idea. This is worship on God's terms. To question or replace the means of grace, therefore, is to challenge the wisdom of God. It was the message of Calvin over and over again in his institutes that we challenge the wisdom of God when we seek to worship him on our own terms. How then should the biblical concept of worship as discipleship impact our approach to Lord's Day worship? Well, first, pastors ought to take great care in the preparation and execution of Lord's Day services. Each element of the service from the call to worship to the benediction plays a significant role in the lifelong maturation and shaping of the Christian disciple. Some treat everything leading up to the preaching as mere frontal matter, but that's a mistake. All the elements of public worship, all the elements of the liturgy are important, if not equal. They all play a part in the believer's spiritual formation. Everything from the call to worship to the benediction play an important part in the believer's spiritual formation and in the spiritual formation of our covenant children. Second, church members ought to diligently and joyfully attend Lord's Day worship services. <clears throat> to neglect worship is, among other things, to disregard Christian discipleship. It's to disregard the ministry of Christ in your life and in the lives of your family members and to underestimate God's chosen means of grace. Public worship, therefore, is not optional. In fact, it's a non-negotiable for every serious Believer, You know, in the Reformed tradition, we have always practiced morning and evening worship because it bookends the day. It bookends the day and helps believers to stay focused on what the day was sanctified for. It's meant to be uh, a market day of the soul, a kind of day for the growth of Christian piety and, and worship. And so we've always had morning and evening worship. And in our day, we've seen Reformed Church after Reformed Church remove the evening service. Now, why would we want to do that? Are we removing the evening service because we have become more spiritual in our day? Well, we know that is not the case. In fact, we have a hunger problem. We have a hunger problem. We don't want, don't want to return to the evening service because, A, we don't understand how important Lord's Day observance and piety is for the Christian life. And secondly, we, uh, we don't understand uh, how important the ministry of Christ is in the context of public worship. There's a wonderful story of uh, an elderly woman uh, who was asked, uh, she was a member of a church in an, in an urban center, and it would take her quite some time to get to the service. She had to take public transportation. It was very difficult. She was feeble. And, uh, and someone asked her, Mrs. Smith, I'm just quite amazed that you come back for the evening service every single Lord's Day. How do you do it? And her answer was, well, my heart gets there first, and my legs follow after. And so that's, that's a wonderful expression of the way Reformed and confessional Presbyterians have approached the Lord's Day over the centuries as that which is wholly dedicated to the Lord and to Christian discipleship and to the ministry of Christ in our lives. So uh, let us heed these words in, uh, in, in Hebrews 10, to hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Lord's Day worship is a weekly oasis of grace for Christian pilgrims traveling on the toilsome way of discipleship. Therefore, dear believer, take advantage of all the spiritual benefits that God offers you and your family in morning and evening worship. Attend worship with eager and joyful expectation, believing that Christ matures his followers in the gathered assembly, believing that Christ uh, 
is active among you as prophet, priest, and king through the worship of the church. And this is worship. This is discipleship on God's terms. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Amen. Amen.